My name is Morna Gerard, and I'm interviewing John Ann Cox for Georgia State University's Women's March Oral History Project. The date is February 15th, 2019, and the interview is taking place in special collections at the Georgia State University Library. So, John, let's start with the year that you were born and where you were born. 1964, right over there. Really? Uh, just across the highway, uh, here in Atlanta, at um, Atlanta Baptist Hospital which was later Georgia Baptist and now Atlanta Medical Center. Did you live in Atlanta your whole life? I did. Yeah. Can you tell me what your uh, parents did? Yes, um, dad was a steel salesman and mom um, still is a real estate agent. She's not technically retired. Still working? Occasionally. She still enjoys it. Can you tell me what your profession is? Yes, I am CEO of a startup company called Grammarie Media. We're a book publisher and a movie studio here in Atlanta. The first true studio with content discovery, development, production, and distribution on the East Coast. We have a methodology for sort of disrupting the Hollywood studio model. I actually think maybe in a, in a few years' time, we need to sit down and do another oral history about exactly all of that. <laughs> That we would have a whole different project, but I think that that would be, it's a very interesting um, sort of take that you have on the, the industry, and I'm very excited about what you're doing. My nephew, instead, was also incredibly excited about what you're doing. So we'll talk about that another another. I'm free that day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been doing that? We had the idea, gosh, about three and a half years ago. Um, it took you know, six months of thinking, and you know, then we sort of got to some low-level investors who said, this is a good idea, but it needs polish, and they sent us to Flashpoint at Georgia Tech, which is a very exclusive and difficult um, business accelerator. You've probably heard this before, only about 10% of all startups succeed, but more than 80% of the ones that go through the accredited accelerator succeed, which is a pretty big jump, and it's incredibly difficult. Um, I always joke that outside of marriage, it's the best and hardest thing I've ever done. But I wouldn't start a business again without it. Um, the experience we had at Georgia Tech and Flashpoint is amazing. And um, tell me, you, you said you're married. I am. Um, when you marched, did you march with your wife? I did not. She went to D.C. Okay. So we sort of divided and conquered. She went to the D.C., the big march. And I was not able to travel at that time. So I went to the Atlanta March. And we'll get to that march just, just in a little sure. minute. When you were um, growing up, can you tell me about your family's political leanings? Yes, uh, I would say left of center, but more center. Um, I think um, mom and dad both drifted more left as they got older and the political climate changed. Um, my memory, and I could be wrong about this, is that they both voted for Nixon. And uh, as my grandfather used to say, that we voted Republican once, and if God will ever forgive us, we'll never do it again. Um, so that was sort of the environment I grew up in. I drifted more center um, as I got older. Um, never quite got to where you'd say center right, and have since drifted more left largely because of climate change, but also because of um, the issues of the Women's March. Were, I guess you could combine the Women's March and the Science March. Those are the elements that have been pushing me left. Do you remember having conversations about politics when you were younger? Oh, yeah. Um, probably not in, you know, since we all agreed it wasn't that, that big a deal. Um, I, I sort of became aware when Jimmy Carter was running, which would have been when I was in seventh grade, I think. Um, 76. I started high school in 77, so right in so. Um, and I felt very strongly at the time. And I, originally I was attracted to Carter because of um, he being from the South and sort of the personality, the whole peanut thing, um, the whole the whole crafted persona was very appealing. But um, as my elementary school did a really good job of starting to articulate what the issues were, and then I would go home and talk about them. 
I, 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 it sort of solidified in that position. And then in high school, when, when Ronald Reagan was running against um, Jimmy Carter, it sort of solidified me um, in the Carter camp. Um, I felt there was an honesty and an authenticity about it. Um, there was an authenticity and an honesty that hurt Jimmy Carter politically. But it sort of cemented my view there. Um, I don't think things like conservation are bad things. I don't think things like sacrifice are bad things. I do believe there's such a thing as the common good. Um, I have a sympathy toward the libertarian position. It's logically sound, it makes sense, and the people who cling to it do so with a great deal of, of, of sincerity and logic. That said, it does ignore that whole idea that, that there's a common good. I think that our problems are larger and they're global. And I think that anything that causes us to look beyond ourselves and towards history and towards legacy is critical, especially now. It would be interesting to see what Carter's legacy has been, given that the, the, what his honesty was what was almost his like, yeah. was his fall, but, but long term as a, a statesman, he, it's been something that people have really clutched onto. I hope so. And I, I, I think that a lot of his policies need a reevaluation especially some of the things that he started that later administrations were able to take credit for. Um, I think there was a lot of economic prosperity in the early years of the Reagan administration that directly resulted from some of Carter's, a great deal of Carter's policies that I don't think he gets credit for, and a lot of long-term damage, especially to the idea of a middle class. Um, the idea of, of, of credit card spending to, um, to benefit the few. And I'm not blaming the rich here, I really don't, because um, the money that flows um, into the economy, the job creation, investments in companies like mine, all come because there's, there's a class of billionaires and, and very rich people eager to seed, and, and that's wonderful. I wish that we were, as a society, giving them more incentives um, to invest. They keep hearing, tax the rich, tax the rich. You know, yay. I'd much rather give them incentive to put that money to where it would do a great deal of good, both in the short term and, more importantly, the long term. We're not um, designed to look past the current political news cycle. And so the tax incentives we pass are meant to make splashes now. Unfortunately, they're not the kind that sustains any kind of democratization of the creation of wealth. And so we have um, a, a growing impoverished class, impoverished class, is that a word? Mm -hmm. um, and a, a disappearing middle class. And I, I guess a shrinking rich class too, but there's much more wealth concentrated there. Um, I, I think the Carter approach to um, incentivize tax credits versus dramatic tax cuts were more beneficial both in the short and long term. That was something I was becoming sort of aware of in high school and gravitated more to it in college. Uh, now the things that Reagan did well, um, the sort of national grandfather, I don't want to diminish because I think it's really important. There is something for being warm and fatherly. And I don't think that the left has necessarily gravitated toward candidates that score high like on a likability. And I think likability is the one statistic that has proven to be reliably predictive. Um, if you look at poll numbers, the margin of error shifts, but it's significant. And there have always been um, errors there. Likability is the one thing that's been consistent. I think the last election is a, is a great. You had two candidates that scored very, very low. One of them scored slightly lower than the other, and that's the one that lost. So if you go back to history, I think that that remains the same. So likability is a factor, and Reagan was the best in my lifetime. Uh, I was born after the Kennedy time, so I, I can't really relate. 
but I think it's important. So are we probably way off topic? No, no, not yeah. at all. This all this all feeds into to, to this this whole subject that we're talking about today. Um, when you know, you, like you said, you you had conversations with your parents when you were younger. Mm -hmm. Did, were they politically active? They voted. Um, that's about it. Uh, I don't remember them going to any kind of meetings. They they read. Um, they watched news as well. But they were big readers. Um, newspaper time, and at the time, newspapers had more actual reporting in them. So it was it was more of an effort to to digest. Um, this was sort of in the pre CNN era, mostly. So that was the the source of any kind of in depth news. And even when CNN emerged, it was a different animal than what it is now, where it shifted more toward entertainment. That to me is a type of activism, just keeping oneself informed. But that's that's really about it. Um, I just discovered recently that um, before all of the cable companies, if a channel had to have, if they had news, you could not have ads during the news. It was pure news. Like, it was I don't news remember that. Broadcasting. In fact, um, I know here in the U.S. for the national, when. Um, when the, the broadcast networks were allocated their, their broadcast space. It was basically given to them for free, yeah. with the understanding that they would devote X number of hours per day to, the, to public good and use. The problem is, is that they could sell ads. So there was an incentive to um, sensationalize. You know, I, I, I hear a, a lot of talk, and I have all my life, about political bias in the media. And it's there to a degree, but what I see a lot more is laziness and sensationalism. And it's not just because they want to have ratings during the news hour, which is critical because they sell ads, but they also want to lead into the show that comes before or comes after rather. Um, so if people are here, they're less likely to change the channel. And people who are over here are less likely to change the channel to yours. So having those news ratings is critical. Sensationalism is the way to do that. Um, I think now there's a lot more agenda-driven news that's meant to appeal to a tribe. Tribalism is, is, is real and exists. Our sort of football team mentality has translated to politics. You know, my, we root for this side. Whatever they're doing must therefore be right. We don't root for that side, that side is the enemy. Which is great in sports, it's really entertaining. In politics it's fatal. I think you see um, on um, both the right and the left newscasting, they're the so-called um, sort of professional newscasters are they're asking questions they already know the answer to, the, like, uh, and they know the answer that that they want to have is the answer they're going to get. That and what I don't see is a lot of follow-up um, and, and and probing. And if you go back even twenty years, there was. I think a stronger urge to um, get beyond talking points and into a, into an era of um, authenticity. I mean, think about the Frost Nixon tapes. Um, imagine somebody doing that today with, with anybody. Uh, oh, granted, that kind of time frame is not going to happen. But that kind of depth really doesn't either. At least not that I've seen. There's also um, much less emphasis on pure reporting and more on opinion. So they have experts coming to discuss an issue, not experts out of the field digging up more information about that issue. And I think a lot of that's because we don't want to pay for reporting. Um, there's this idea that, that anything that's not physical doesn't have value. So if we're reading news on the internet, we expect it to be free because you know, it wasn't printed on paper and delivered. And there are people who uh, would download music illegally that would never dream of you know, stealing a CD from Target and it's not just because of fear, fear of being caught. They perceive the um, physical CD to have value, whereas the songs don't. Um, we need to get back to where we value intellectual property, especially reporting, or I, I don't see a really sustainable path for democracy. Well, this um, challenges with the media has been a very, um, uh, in the forefront 
the last couple of years. We will we'll come back to that um, sure. later in, in this interview. Um, so I want to get back to, to you and your political beliefs. Did you do any kind of activism yourself? I've done volunteering. Okay. Um, my wife actually does more. She's been canvassing, uh, actually going and knocking on doors. I do a lot more um, letter writing, um, or I should say email writing. Uh, I hope that counts. Um, and calling my, represent my representatives. And um, I'm actually kind of embarrassed because um, I don't write to my congressman, John Lewis, a lot because I look at that and say, ah, oh, he's got it. So I'm not giving the rah-rah support that I should. Um, I do write to my senators a great deal. And I'm very frustrated with the answers I get back that are very canned, that don't seem to assume that I'm educated. Um, I, I'm not pleased. Now, before all of this, the, the march happened and, and this, this whole, that, that whole election cycle, were you, did you go to any, when you were younger, did you go to any marches or, or were you involved in anything? Really? I don't remember any marches um, for a cause. Um, the closest thing I can remember is actually here at Georgia State in um, the early 80s, I think 83, 84, when We Are the World came out. They had a big gathering out um, in Hurt Park and had a big screen where the song debuted around the world at the same time. So there was this huge crowd out in the park um, waiting to set song and everybody was talking about hunger in Africa. And I don't remember another time in my life where anybody was talking about hunger in Africa, much less this mass, diverse, young, energetic, and very engaged crowd. What I have done is gone to uh, political speeches, rallies, things of that sort. Um, when the Democratic Convention was here um, during my Georgia State time, I used my signal credentials to go and um, cover that convention uh, from up front. Um, Geraldine Ferraro, running for vice president, spoke in um, Woodruff Park. Um, had a rally there. I remember going to that again during my Georgia State years. Um, going to see everybody from uh, Paul Songus and uh, John Edwards way back in the day. Um, and the Carter Center does an amazing job of bringing in really important speakers. I haven't gone to a bad program there ever. Um, they're really worth Just pick one. Any of them, they're amazing. We're really lucky to have that. Like truly are. Set. And I would encourage more people to take advantage of it, but everything I go to is full, and it's kind of hard to get tickets, so stay home, guys. We're good. <laughs> I want to come back to the fact that, because this is very interesting about you, that you went to Georgia State University. Can you tell me what you studied? Yes, it was interdisciplinary writing. Um, it was a sort of self-created major, where I had um, English, creative writing, uh, journalism, PR, and play and film writing. And you are, you're very interesting uh, in that you were the first male, were you the first male to attend Agnes Scott College? Can you tell me about that? Yes, um, there was one of the classes I needed here at Georgia State that had not been offered in a, in a long time. Um, so there's this cross-registration program and um, the school that had it available was um, Agnes Scott. Now Georgia State's on quarter and Agnes Scott's on semester. So it was a little tricky. I wound up having to take more classes than I just got than I would have otherwise. But it was an amazing experience. It was really, really awkward the first day, um, knowing I was going to stand out. Um, also, um, what I didn't know at the time was they had a rule against wearing shorts. And uh, I wore shorts, um, Hawaiian bright shorts. So um, not the best first day ever. Um, and then, insult to injury, we were, it was a play, a play class, a, a theater class. Um, and I was, instead of writing the paper, I was working on, on writing. And uh, so, I don't remember what the play was, but the theme of the first play was misogyny. So, um, halfway through the lecture, I had to raise my hand and admit that I didn't know what the word meant. Um, and so I was explaining, I thought, well, this is awkward. Um, everybody got a chuckle out of it. Afterwards, everybody was saying, you know, we usually just write them all down and go look them up after class. And the professor just had a fit. She's going, you mean all this time? 
you've been not understanding my lectures and going and looking them up afterwards, don't do that. But I would, I would constantly get the questions of what do men think? And I would always answer to them, well, speaking for all men, or funny you should ask, we just had a meeting and we took a vote. And I probably screwed up an entire generation's view of what women, men think, um, or at least an entire group of Agnes Scotland. Did, were you welcomed on campus? Oh yeah, it was great. Uh, I, there was um, an assembly where um, you know we sort of all gathered as as a as a as a, as a, as a group. All these women and, and one me, and uh, a lot a large part of it was about men. And that was a bit awkward, but you know I was prepared now, so I knew what we were up to. Did it affect you? Did it affect the way you viewed women, or your your did it affect the way you saw yourself as a man in the world at all? I don't think so. Uh, I think at that point I, I was already pretty settled in. Um, it affected me more as, as a writer because the writing classes I was taking were very different than the ones I was taking here at Georgia State. Um, in what way? Different professors, really. Um, different point of view. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with the fact that they were aimed at a different gender. It was just a different, a different approach. Um, there was less emphasis on structure and mechanics of how story works, and more emphasis on character and word choice. But again, I think that was just Bo Ball, the one professor, um, the late great Bo Ball, who understood short stories on a level that I, I never will. And I don't remember the other professor he had was a woman. I can't remember her last name. Her first name was Linda. And um, they were they were both really amazing. Um, Linda was not actually a writing teacher. She was teaching plays as literature. Um, but I was actually writing um, structurally a play. So when I actually gave my oral presentation, it was on structure. And um, there was a lot of conversation after that as to whether that um, demystified or, or took the magic out of storytelling. I don't think it, tell, it does at all. It's like, it, it, it's, it's like language. You still have to know the mechanics and the tools you have. You don't have to use them. Um, I actually give a talk. I, I gave a year at Georgia State not too long ago on, on storytelling and the mechanics of storytelling and the tools. And I'm really careful to say at the beginning, these aren't rules. These are just tools that are available to you. And they're available because they work cross-culturally and throughout time. I'm not saying there, there are no rules in storytelling, there are. I mean, if you're gonna write a police procedural, it's pretty much a given that one of your characters has to be a police officer. But that's not really what I was talking about at Agnes Scott. Yeah. One thing that was really strange, uh, there was one I really wanted to, to ask out on a date, but I didn't feel like I could ask her during class. I waited till the semester to end and then asked her out. Um, and that was never the case in Georgia State. Why did, why did you feel like you couldn't? To this day, I'm not sure I know how to, the answer to that. I guess I felt like she was sort of trapped and there wasn't an awkward, easy way to, to retreat. And if it went poorly, we'd be seeing her every day um, in a situation where neither of us could leave. Um, and it was a really small room. Um, I'm not really sure, because I never had that experience in Georgia State. Now, that, uh, since we're talking about you being at a, a women's college, I want to talk a little bit about feminism. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me, do you, do you feel like you are a feminist or are you not? I do now, but it's kind of a new thing. Um, and ironically enough, what changed my mind was an editorial cartoon. Um, it was, it was, I used to think, well, I'm not just a feminist, I'm a humanist. I think everybody. Um, it wasn't Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. And uh, then I saw an editorial cartoon that had um, a house on fire, and then two houses down was a bunch of fire trucks, and they were spraying water on the house, another house. And the caption was, All Houses Matter. Um, it, That's it, powerful. It did, it did. It, it lit a switch for me. It's like, oh, I get it now, yeah, yeah. Um, the lives that are threatened are the lives that you stand up for. 
um, you know, throwing a, a life preserver to a strong, strong swimmer isn't going to make anybody a hero. Um, coming from a place of, of white male privilege, um, understanding that and understanding that other people don't have it means that those are the people you have to stand up and side with. So then, yeah, um, I started thinking of myself as a feminist. I had a mentor at Georgia State, I mean, at Georgia Tech in the Flashpoint program named Kurt Ron, who also went to the Women's March. I know that because I saw him from a great distance running down a hill, and I couldn't get close enough to even say hello. But on Kurt's bio, one of the first things he listed was feminist. Um, very out there, um, very dramatic, very powerful, and um, without any sort of fear or, fear or filter. And um, that was an eye opener as well. That's great. So, absolutely now, I would say yes without hesitation. I even have a little button at home. Um, I did not before. Um, so, I want to start talking about the march itself, or, or like getting toward the march. Can you go back to the night of the election um, yeah. in 2016? I can. And tell me how that played out for you. Um, the election night was not that dramatic for me because I think about April, I was already sort of resigned. Um, I didn't think Hillary Clinton was likely to be elected. Um, again, the likability factor. Um, Two had been a really strong Bernie Sanders um, supporter. Again, largely because of climate change. And um, a lot of organizations I respect, like the Union of Concerned Scientists, had not given Hillary Clinton a, a, a high grade. So um, I sort of thought, this is going to go poorly. And um, it was a really strong disconnect between my wife and me, because she was a huge Hillary fan and believed that there was no way Hillary Clinton could lose. And when I was crushed and in a dark place in April, I thought she was very dismissive. And then election night came, and I sort of fell asleep. And I woke up, and you know, Carol was weeping openly. And I kind of fell back asleep. Shame on me. Um, and she was also um, in that dark place and thought I had been dismissive. So we had some serious conversations about that. I think uh, I think we, we came closer together because of it. Um, but my despair had been going on for a really long time by election night. And um, you know, having it confirmed was just sort of the cherry on top of the Sunday. That was, of course, Sundays are good, so I probably shouldn't use that analogy. It was the uh, last bit of kale on a heaping pile of wilted kale. Excuse me. Thank you. Bless you. Thanks. I apologize. No. Um, I'm going to an allergist next week, so I can't take an antihistamine or anything. So. No problem. So when um, did you decide you were going to go to the march? As soon as I heard about it. Okay. Um, I knew there was one in Atlanta, and I assumed that Carol and I would go together. Um, and I saw a building, and um, you, I, I was definitely going to be a part of it. Um, I was surprised when Carol just sort of announced that she was going to DC. I was thrilled. I was delighted. I was very supportive, but very surprised because she was going alone. It's not really her thing, and um, mildly worried, um, but overall just absolutely delighted. And I thought it was great that we'd have a presence of both. Um, very partnering. You cover this one, not cover this one. We got it um, because I really wanted Atlanta to have good numbers too. And I, I, at that point, I didn't think that the numbers in Atlanta would be what they turned out to be. Um, and it's actually funny because she went alone, but actually ran, wound up running into one of our neighbors who was just two houses down. Um, I think they had another friend with them as well. Now, but they sort of found each other there. Carol still has her signs. Do you think she might want to donate them? She would, yeah. Um. So you chose Atlanta because you, you, you felt 
But with it, it did look like it was going to be, uh, I think, the speakers, as he started announcing the speakers. Yeah. It was like, this is going to be a really, really good. Yeah. I mean, they, I, was, uh, I was so impressed with that. I, I was. Um, like I said, I wasn't expecting it to be anywhere near what it was. But I thought it was important to be out there and just stand with. with what, so when you decided, like, because most people went, when they went to March, they had, there were things that, that are core to them. And you talk about climate change is really important to you. Were there any other sort of things you felt very passionately about that you needed to represent for yourself at the March? Um, to a large part, um, at this point, I was appalled by um, my perception uh, of, of Donald Trump as a misogynist. I, I now know the word. Um, and that was the face we were going to be showing to the world. And that was what America stood for. That was the values that America had chosen by which to stand and be counted. And I wanted to not be counted that way. I wanted to show a different face. Um, and the Women's March was the obvious place to do that. That was where those values were represented. And if you want to stand and be counted, you go to Weeper where people are standing and, and being counted. Um, can you did, you, did you think you'd get, was there anything you thought you personally would get out of the march before you went? No, um, I, 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 I'm not sure we really had expectations. Um, exercise, maybe. Um, kidding aside, um, I, I really didn't have expectations. Um, it felt somewhere between a, a compulsion and a call, I guess, to go. Um, but that was it. It was just, this is something I have to do. It, it wasn't really a question of if. Um, it was a question of, of, of how. Um, and it wound up being a, a, an astonishing experience. I wound up going with my church. Our church went as a congregation. Um, they... And what church is that? It's called Neighborhood Church. It's, it's on this sort of extreme liberal edge of United Methodism. Currently, find out what happens in two weeks. Um, there's a potential schism coming in the Methodist Church. and. Um, there's a called conference um, that's, that's sort of deciding uh, the fate and direction. So um, there are some people that believe it will be a re-strengthening of United Methodism. There are some that will think it will be a schism. And the question is, you know, how deep and how messy? Um, I think I'm somewhere between those two extremes. Um, I'm really concerned. But I know that the people I'm with now are the people that I want to stand with because they themselves are taking a stand. And I think there's something about people who are strongly committed to something that's very attractive. And you sort of want to be close to the people that have that, that level of commitment, and that level of passion, really for anything, but especially for something that seems so important and so timely and so critical to the direction of the world. So for that reason, I, I'm at Neighborhood Church. And, I went with them, and you know we gathered at the church. We walked through pouring, driving rain to the Marta Station. How many of you were there? Probably 20 or 30, maybe. Um, I should back up. Neighborhood Church was at that point new um, and emerging. Um, it had been born of, there was a church called Epworth. That's actually on my street. Um, that was closing. It was worshiping about 8 on a Sunday. And then Druid Hills was also closing. Um, and they sort of combined and utterly shut down for a bit to sort of have, uh, I think, a six or eight month Sabbath to sort of recreate themselves into something new. And for a while, they're calling themselves a new church before settling on neighborhood church. Um, and which, by the way, is a great name. Um, I could go into the details of that, but it's sort of off topic. But, um, you know, they had opened up the sanctuary space on election night for people who needed a place to come be with others and, and, and grieve, which I found out about much later, or I probably would have gone. You just give goosebumps to sing. Yeah. Um, 
but now they're worshiping, you know, more than 120. Um, they just finished a renovation of the building. It's never going to be a beautiful church. It's it's just not. But it's so hospitable now. It's warm. It's a community space, and there are a lot of people using it um, for non-church activities. It's sort of become a community center, uh, a third space, the way churches used to be in the olden days. And it's relevant. Um, it's very active um, in support of LGBTQ. I always get those numbers confused. So I hope I get that right. Letters, letters confused. Um, um, Anti-racism um, and other such things that I think are in, unfortunately increasingly critical. We also went to the um, uh, Muslim march um, when the Muslim ban was announced down at the airport. And I actually didn't go with the church that time. I went with Carol. But I saw a bunch of them and just knowing that that congregation is there. And they participated in both the Pride March and the uh, Science March. The Science March actually started right in front of the church and went circled around back. So it, it was really great. Um, and it was also great to understand that this is a church that supports science and knows that um, you know, it's not about getting lost in the details of the story. It's remembering what those stories are pointing to. That's important. It's kind of awesome that there's you know, a church which is a place people feel, feel safe and but they're, they're, they're kind of um, taking a, a, a rule of bringing you all together for things you all feel strongly about, I feel, and then you feel safe going with this, because going to a march can be quite daunting. Absolutely can. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real, um, a beautiful thing that, that a church yeah. provides that safe space for people to, to sort of go in their faith to, to um, yeah, and you know, Bravo to Atlanta because they did the same thing for the Women's March. And I know this is off topic, we'll come back. But um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard stories about the police there and how amazing they were. And how everybody was high, high fiving the police as they walked by. Um, and even the Falcons, who um, I, I don't think the ownership necessarily sees eye to eye with me politically. But um, they have a big sign that on, on the dome that faces where the march was. They used to say, defend the dome. And they changed it that day from red to pink. And it said, defend the fifth. As in the fifth, you know, the crumbling fifth district, so. Oh. Which um, it was very subtle. And it wasn't exactly um, an endorsement, but it was a gesture. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I found it very moving. Well, I, I'm definitely very moved yeah. by that. Um, I have not heard anyone, no one has told me that that, that, that happened. It was so. Um, I think, one, you have to have known originally it was red, and you have to know that it originally said defend the dome and what that meant. And you'd have to know that John Lewis and the 5th District. And, wow. Um, so it was a bit subtle. Okay. I think I'll also take a clinic's break while we're. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the makeup of the group? Like, like well, most of us didn't wear any. Hmm? Most of us didn't wear any. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Um, in our group, it was probably 55 45. Um, pretty close to even. Um, There's also a lot of kids. And one of my favorite signs ever was one little girl had a sign that said, My First March. And one that said, Though she be, she be a bit little, she is fierce. From um, and seeing kids learning about activism and the power of a march and the power of the unity that follows a march was, was really moving. It feels like this is the like, first generation in many, maybe ever, who are getting an introduction into social justice, stepping up, the power of the, the mass, all of that stuff <laughs> at, at such an early age. I have a theory about that. Um, I mean, one is things are so bad that it's necessary. The second one is um, there's a generation that I think is getting politically active without influence from their parents necessarily. And I think it's coming from story. Um, we might have had this conversation before, but I, we haven't. Um, there's a whole generation that's growing up on Marvel movies and Harry Potter and The Hunger Games. 
And they're starting to internalize those stories and the patterns in those stories. And if you think about the Hunger Games, it looks very bleak and dark on the surface. You know, violence of kids against kids. And I don't think it's dark at all. I think it's very uplifting and powerful. And the reason for that is if you're in the third grade playing dodgeball with bullies, and then you come home and there's climate change and school shootings on TV, that's what the world looks like to you. What the Hunger Games says is that you're empowered to change it. Um, so they've grown up on Harry Potter, they've grown up on Hunger Games, which all have stories of a cartoonish supervillain taking control and um, the adult establishment not stepping in to protect them. So the kids learn to sort of band together with their friends, work around the adult establishment and make meaningful change. So then we get the school shooting in Parkland and those kids are now traveling around the world and when they go, voting among millennials and young people really skyrockets. They've internalized that story and they're living it out now. So the stories we're putting out in the world are starting to change how people engage with the world. I'm not sure that that was the intent when those stories were crafted, but that's the result. And I think we're just scratching the surface now. It's going to be very interesting to, to watch this this whole like for the next I'd say twenty years to see yeah. what happens. Uh, if you think about this, you know what the Soviet Union was trying to do with their propaganda or Germany. Nazi Germany was trying to do with their propaganda films. That was faked, but this is authentic. And because of that authenticity, I think it's taking root in a way that propaganda normally doesn't. No, you're very right. Um, it's also. Um, <laughs> Did, when you were, when you were, I want you to talk about getting to the march. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me your, your journey. You met at the church. We met at the church. Um, we assembled and um, texted people who were going to meet us at Marta and coordinated as best we could. And then um, we took our umbrellas and, and marched through a really torrential storm to the Marta station. Um, Which Marta station did you get on? East, uh, not East Lake, uh, Edgewood County Park. Which is just right around. It's uh, about a thousand steps, in fact. A bit. Um, so we, we, we walked there and somewhere you know, on the train platform there was a huge crowd. I saw a lot of neighbors, um, a lot of those um, pussy hats, and sort of gathered that most people there were going where we were. There weren't many people who just wandered into Marta going somewhere else that day. Um, and there was actually singing, you know, a lot of like, we, we shall overcome and stuff like that on the platform. That was, I haven't seen for any of the marches, so that was really great. Um, How did you feel when you saw that many people? Warmed, encouraged, uh, goose bumpy. Um, it was sort of like you know hearing you know the St. Crispin's Day speech from Shakespeare. Um, it really sort of got the blood pumping, and we're here to change things, and we're gonna. Um, it was very uplifting, very powerful. Um, the music, the crowd, the energy, and that instant camaraderie. Um, there were people I knew from other places um, that I was seeing, you know, other neighbors. Um, it was like, oh, you too, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but there was an instant kinship um, that has endured even past the march. Um, and do you think that really, in some ways, makes a local march much more powerful? Because you're 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 seeing your community members who are really truly then community members with you that you might not have. It's hard to, it's hard to answer that, and um, largely because you know, I've, I've been hearing about Carol's experience and how much it was coming together with this vast crowd of strangers and feeling that instant bond, and just suddenly understanding the world is my community. Um, there's probably a wall joke here. But it was about breaking down barriers. There were, there were no class barriers. There were no racial barriers. There were no gender barriers, and no gender identity barriers. Um, it was a community that was there for a common purpose and common good, to enact meaningful change in a very positive way for for everyone. Um, I don't know if it if, if the local 
versus the, the national. Um, because the marches we went to together, you know, the science march, uh, the airport march, were somewhat smaller. Um, I think the science were funniest at the airport march. Um, I don't know, I guess they're each powerful in their own way. Um, I'm more of a, of a local with my community, my hometown. Um, Carol's more of the world, I think, than I am. So maybe we each just gravitated to the right march for us. But I also think it was important that our family represented both. I, I still find that very moving. So when you got, did you get off at five points? Or the dome? Uh, we got off at the yeah, we go for the dome, okay. uh, and we walked down to where the marches were. Um, what did you see? Tell me what, what you were seeing when you got off the train and started ma marching towards the... A lot of pink hats. Um, I, I mean, who, who knew that the only way, what it took to get people engaged was crafting. Um, you know, we're having a, 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 a march for um, climate change, and scrapbooking. Maybe that would uh, bring them out. Um, you know, there's just this river of pink ahead of me. Um, trying to read all the signs. Um, I actually have pictures on my phone still. Um, but mostly just the scale, the vastness of it. Um, I'm convinced that the um, numbers were underreported because the police said they were counting within a perimeter. Um, and said, this is our job, is to estimate here. Um, what's beyond this? We got nothing. I mean, and I know that the march swelled way beyond, um, way beyond. Was it 64,000 or something they said? 60-something yeah. thousand? The week before, I went to an event with the organizers and they were hoping for 10,000 people. Yeah, well, bravo. Uh, I was expecting five to 10, honestly. So. It was a lot more than, than what I was expecting. Um, I also thought we were going to be way early. Well, first of all, there was the miracle of the fact that the rain utterly vanished and the weather was um, fantastic. Um, so there was that. Um, not sure exactly where to go, but you know, no sweat there. Um, we got close enough to actually see and hear the speeches, um, mostly. Um, you, we could mostly hear it, but there was a lot of cheering, and uh, the sound wasn't the best. But it would have been great for 10,000 people. Um, and then when the march finally started, um, you know, waiting our turn to start moving, which was a while, um, trying to stay close, and you know, we broke into increasingly smaller groups, um, and uh, you know, seeing people I know from all over. Many of whom I could get to and speak to, most of whom I could not. Um, it was just, it was truly astonishing. Um, I, I really couldn't, uh, couldn't conceive. I was also um, really surprised at, um, you know, long time nerd, seeing uh, how thoroughly represented Star Wars was. And the whole idea of resistance and rebellion was absolutely embraced. Um, in fact, that, that rebellion um, symbol from Star Wars with a safety pen through it became an emblem, um, a sort of secret salute. And uh, I later um, saw a woman wearing the Star Wars rebellion emblem with her safety pen through it and made a Star Wars joke to her and she had no idea it had come from Star Wars. Um, and was even more delighted when she found out. But um, a lot of pop, pop culture references twisted. Um, a lot of cleverness and thought and artistry in those signs that showed me that this wasn't a momentary, just let's go see what's happening, that this was something people had anticipated and planned for and, and put a lot of heart and effort into. That surprised me to a degree. I didn't have a sign. I was just about to ask I had you. a shirt, but um, that was about it. Did you have a hat? I did not. Um, don't crochet. Um, at the time, um, I don't know if, 
I, I really didn't know where, where, where one obtained one, if, if one was not one self at Crafter. What did you think of the Pussy Hats as like a, a symbol, as a, as a statement? Um, um, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was funny. Um, I sort of like the idea of a gesture, of an instant recognizable symbol as something that sort of unites you. Like when you see it, you, you do the nod, the, the smile, the wink, but you know you're on the same side, you're part of a community. Um, and that's how I loved it. Um, the wit was great, but I think the community and what it represented was, was stronger. Um, I'm also not entirely sure, it took me a while to get comfortable with the idea that it would be appropriate for men to wear them. Um, it's one of those, it's okay for me to say this, it's not okay for you to say it. Um, I'm still not sure where I land on that one. Um, I think it was enough to, to be there. You said you wore a shirt, did your shirt say anything? Uh, yeah, I should have worn it today. Oh, it. that's it. It was a, um, it was a, a play on Star Wars. It had a picture of Barack Obama and said, A New Hope. And it had a picture of Donald Trump and says, The Empire Strikes Back. And it had Bernie Sanders and says, Return of the Jedi. Uh -huh. with, with the years, you know, ending of 2020. So it, it was funny. Uh, it's probably the most photographed shirt I've ever owned because I was constantly stopping to. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of pictures that people that have pictures of me from that parade, I don't think any of them have a picture of my face. It's just the shirt. Sure. Just the shirt. When you were looking around at the crowd, um, do, can you tell me what you saw in terms of gender, in terms of um, race and age, and just generally, who, 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 who was around you? Great diversity. I think age-wise, um, I saw at least two women in wheelchairs that were being pushed because they're of age, not, not anything other than age, to my knowledge. Um, I saw a lot of really young children, um, you know, three, five and up. Um, I would say most were in their 20s to 40s, 20s to 50s maybe, but that's probably true of any crowd. Um, I, I also think it was pretty close to 50-50. Um, it was majority white, um, but only, but only to the I don't think it was different than the population splits. Um, I actually don't know what the population of the greater Atlanta area is, but I guess probably 60% white, 50% um, 55% white, the rest were non-white, obviously, I guess that would be the other option. Um, but uh, um, a pretty strong mix of both Asian, uh, African American, and um, Latino. Um, you, you mentioned the police. Did you see a lot of police a officers lots, around? Lots. I always said thank you, and I got a lot of hey, thank you. And one of them was holding a sign that said, "We're keeping you safe so you can march for us," or something like that. It was really great. And all the high fiving, people walking by and high fiving the police was just amazing. Um, I really felt protected, but I also felt like they were. You know, I don't want to accuse the police of being political because I don't think they were, but I, I, I felt supported, yeah. uh, protected, and, and welcomed. And uh, it was the same with everyone. In, in fact, I actually saw, you know, I went to the, one at the airport uh, and I came back two days later for, for business, I was picking somebody up, and I thanked one of the policemen there. And uh, he was saying, eh, I'm glad to help. Got a little out of hand, people kept coming in. Take cutting through the airport. We tried to tell them not to do that. And that was the only negative thing I ever heard from a police officer. But I imagine they were having a lot of trouble because, you know, it's a pretty crowded airport already. So having extra people walking through that they had no aviation business was, was probably tough on them. But that, even that was a shrug, not a err. That was actually, just to go off topic a little bit, the, the fact that that many people turned up at the airport in such a short notice. Yeah. Because there was a Facebook post that I saw that morning, and there was, a, was it like 10,000 people or something turned up? I don't remember the numbers, but it, it was a lot. By afternoon. Yeah. yeah. And that was one where 
like how the church went. I didn't go with them, but we were all, we wound up being on the same train with them because you know we got on the East Lake by our house, and the next station is is Counter Park where they were, and so you know I texted them, hey, we're behind you guys. We'll look for you when we get off, which right did not happen. Uh, but it was great. It also had the single funniest sign that I've ever seen. That, uh, oh, here's my bad language. You can use it. Yeah. Go for it. It said, first they came from the Muslims, and we said, not this time, motherfucker. And the word motherfucker was in orange. <laughs> The women's march. Do you recall what the sort of mood of the crowd was? Um, if there's such a thing as positive um, euphoric anger, I think that would be it. Um, there was a lot of frustration, anger, and fear, certainly. But the strength of numbers, the show of support, the community, I think turned into a very positive thing. And I think the fact there is so much activism and um, so much sort of ground roots motion largely came out from the good feeling that was there at that march. Were you comfortable chanting? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. You, you did. Were there were there any chants that you were like you liked the best? Do you remember? Um, th there was the this is what democracy looks like a lot. Um, and that's the one I remember the most um, because I think that's really what this is about. Um, you can't suppress turnout in a march. Well, I mean, I guess you can. Um, don't want to put that out there. Um, but hearing that many voices, and um, you know, you, you you know, you'd seen the size of the inauguration crowd, and seeing this, um, and seeing this all over the world. Um, the president of our company is in LA, and she was sending me pictures, and I was sending her pictures. Um, is that during the march? Yeah. She was at the LA March. And um, I have a friend in Paris who was sending me pictures from the Paris March. How did it make you feel seeing like this is not just an American thing either? This is something that people are. Very encouraged. Um, you know, I like to see that passion, you know, maintained. I, mean, I think the reason Xavier Abrams did so well here in Georgia is because a lot of that positive feeling was still carrying forward. Um. In fact, um, I, I happened to be at uh, Goldman Sachs in New York for um, an event that they did with the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and um, you know, about 50 of my fellow CEOs um, and the governor and lieutenant governor and the mayor of Atlanta, uh, who apparently are not tight, by the way. Um, but that crowd was there, and then Goldman Sachs sort of gave a welcome speech, which included some very thinly veiled criticism of, of our, our, our current governor's administration um, and the national administration, um, which, given the source, really surprised me. Um, it was it was veiled, but I remember talking to one of my friends at the uh, at the chamber, who I know feels the same way politically, and saying, "Boy, this is uncomfortable." And he said, no, this is great. Um, because the chamber, well, I shouldn't speak to the chamber, but I know, I know there's been some some nerves on their side. And um, I think they were very comfortable to, to get a word of support from that left-leaning radical group, Goldman Sachs. Um, I, I think it was very encouraging to them. It certainly was to me. Yeah, that's very cool. During, uh when you were walking, I guess either um, on the train or at the rally or while you were walking, did you see any opposition protesters? No. I didn't even hear they were there. There's usually a few. I, I heard them on Facebook. Um, but mostly it was the, what exactly are you marching for? What, what rights do women not have? Um, that sort of thing. Um, did you have any friends that um, did not approve of you going? Yeah. How did you uh, deal with that? Not, not approve, that disagreed. Oh, disagreed with you. Disagreed with the position. I don't think anybody was, was, was getting on to me for going. 
Um, I know it's kind of a thin line of distinction, but uh, I do have some, some brethren on the right. Uh, I have a friend from high school who's one of my favorite debating partners. Um, I know a lot of things he brings up just because he knows it'll get my goat. And bravo to it, because it, it always works. Um, but he debates from, from a place of, of, of respect and honesty. And, you know, I, I can't complain about that. Do you ever, did you actually have um, space to talk about why you were marching, or, or did you, was it with? Purely on Facebook. Okay. Um, and I, for the most part, it eventually would, would devolve when other people would come in, yeah. um, at which point I would, I would shut it off. But um, by and large, it was, it was respectful. And, well attended. So did you march all the way to the, the end point and listen to the speakers there? Um, I did march all the way to the end. Um, and by that point, we were kind of near the end. I think the speakers had finished. Um, there was one or two, but all the famous people had gone. And at that point, it was... Um, Really needing a restroom, uh, and and ideally food, and we were going to go get on the Marta here at Georgia State, and that was not a possibility by even a little bit. So we um, we turned right and started heading towards King Memorial, and there was a bar along the way, which I'm going to mention because they deserve it, called Bada Bings, and they had a, they have a sign that was restrooms are for customers only. And below that, they taped up a sign, except for today. Um, so uh, I actually made a point to come back to that bar um, because it was a very welcome, very welcome sign. Um, so I probably shouldn't mention a commercial name like Bada Bings, okay. but since Bada Bings did do a great job and really was accommodating, um, I think it's appropriate to mention Bada Bings. Mm -hmm. So I did. <laughs> when you were, so you managed to get to, were you able to get on the train when you got back to Eventually, uh, yeah, the yeah. station? I was actually, you know, saying, let's just walk. It's not that far. It's like three miles. You know, we can do it. But there were small children. Um, so we got on the train. Um, and it was tight, but not oppressive. What was the mood like on the train on the way home? Same. A uh, little bit of singing, a lot of laughing. Um, people holding their signs up still, and still the chanting, the democracy and all that. Um, I, mean, I, I think the march ended when people got home, because um, you were still seeing people, you know, we walked back to the church and then I walked home. I was still seeing people out. Uh, now granted, in my neighborhood, uh, I know there's at least two Republicans, but that may, may well be all. Um, and neither of those two are, are supporters of the current administration. Um, they're sort of the old school conservative, which is a voice I didn't necessarily agree with, but I really liked having it in the debate. I, I think it was important. And the fact that it's gone, I think, is, is, is very harmful to, really to the world, not just, not just America. Because um, I, I don't really see that voice anywhere else, the serious conservatism. Um, Be that as it may, um, most of my neighborhood um, drifts left of center to all the way off the, the left edge, um, except for those those two those two houses. Um, so my neighborhood was 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 mostly there. So there's a lot of people walking back. So did you have to go home and just hang out on your own? You know, I don't, was in DC? Yeah, I don't know what I did that night. Um, yeah, I might have gone out. It, it's, it's been a long time. I, I have such vivid memories of everything up until I got home. I really don't remember what it So it was probably anticlimactic. You know, I've got a dog. Probably had to walk in. And, you know, after you march that far, it's really not high on your list of things you want to do. Um, now, I might have even driven into the park that day. Um, did you manage to keep, keep in touch with Carol throughout the day? Yeah, text. Um, she was sending me pictures. I sent her pictures. And Alice sent me hers. She had more celebrities than hers. 
Um, she had one of, um, I can't remember the woman's name, but she plays Supergirl. Oh, yeah. On uh, Supergirl. Mm -hmm. And she was holding a sign that said, Don't grab my pussy, it's made of steel. Uh, which I thought was great. And so I was getting all those from Alice. Um, but yeah, mostly, mostly good pictures. So did Carol come back the next day or did she stay till Monday? I believe it was the next day. Okay. Um, and when she did get back, did like continue you had a long conversation? Mostly, oh, did you see, did you see, did you see? It was more of that type. Um, rather than the um, what did it mean to you, the soul searching type of stuff. Uh, that sort of came out over time and, and you know, still comes out. Um, especially when we went to the next march. Yeah, I think that, I guess the airport was next, then science. Um, it, the chronology is getting confused. Um, and then there was a, a mother's um, rally at the Capitol we went to. Um, which might have been after all of those. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, there's a good time to, I'd love to see one now after the national emergency. Um, but I, I'm not, not really seeing the enthusiasm for a march now. Yeah, we'll get to that just in a minute. Um, um, I want to go back to like the day after the march. Were you looking at the news? Oh, yeah. So what, what, what did you think about how it was reported? Um, I was fine with it. Um, most of it seemed very positive. Most of them seemed surprised. There was a lot of comparison shots of, of um, the, um, the Women's March to the inauguration crowd. I remember seeing that over and over and over again, to the point that I thought it was a bit unfair. It sort of wasn't the point. It wasn't a competition. Um, an inauguration is different than a march. Um, so I'd rather have seen more emphasis on what was said, on the signs, on the people, rather than the comparison. But that's a minor complaint at best. That's almost a nitpick more than a complaint. Because I did think they did a great job of capturing the enthusiasm and the energy and the fact that it's endured. And, you know, we're starting to see the, the results in elections now. Um, I don't think AOC would have been elected without that sort of groundswell of energy that happened really at that march. I completely agree. Um, so you said that you've been active since since March with like writing letters. And yeah, it's really here. easy to be a slacktivist. Um, it's like good term. Have you not heard of it? No. no. Um, you know, when you when you stay on your couch and you go share memes and share articles. Um, and if I had a dollar for every time I shared something from Scientific American, where they say climate change science is settled, really, um, I could solve climate change. Um, <clears throat> writing a letter, you know, you'll get a form letter and you rewrite it, which I wind up rewriting a lot, just because that's, that's me. Um, and saying them to my, my, my senators, mm -hmm. if I wanted to keep pressure on um, and, and I've kept that up fairly well. <clears throat> I plan to get involved in somebody's campaign um, for 2020. I don't yet have any idea who's, especially, I don't think we still know who's running, but that'll narrow down. I had this great fear it's going to be two debates like we had for the Republicans last year. And nobody was going to sit through two debates. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of depth of, of, of issue that, that can't be discussed in, in that kind of debate format, which is, which is a shame. Because I think the nuances of, of policy are important, um, especially in this cycle. Um, there's a lot that are easy to get behind and be enthusiastic about because they put it nicely on a bumper sticker, like Medicare for All. Um, but there are a lot of approaches to healthcare that need to be discussed in great detail. And the differences on these plans. And I, 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 
there's a part of me that's going to vote for the first politician. They'll say, well, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, it'll never happen. Um, but I'd love to see that level of debate. And with the number of candidates and the need for ratings over substance, I, I, I will never see that type of debate. But I hope that the field will, will, will narrow. Yeah. Do you have anyone who you think, man, I hope you run? Or, or is there anyone who's, who's already put their, their hat in that you think could, could be successful? It's almost easier to think the ones that I think can't. Um, I think a lot of Kamala Harris's um, past um, with the donations she took and cases that weren't prosecuted and um, some decisions she made as a prosecutor will not play well in general. Um, I, I have uh, a lot of sympathy for Elizabeth Warren. I'm not sure what kind of campaigner she is. Um, I know there's a lot of call for a unity ticket, like a Biden Warren ticket or something like that. Um, I don't think that'll happen. I honestly, I, I'm not sure I know right now. It's, it's, who knows who's going to be, like, there's just so many of them coming forward and, you know, yeah. will tell. Can you talk about how you, it's been a while since, since Trump was elected. Seems like. <laughs> um, can you tell me how you sort of, like, well, as as time has gone on, well, he has he has managed to um, get consistently worse, which I would not have thought was possible. Um, I didn't expect this level of, of, of distruth and, and gaslighting. Um, I didn't expect this level of science to absolute denial um, or intelligence denial. Um, it it. it I, I, I think that it's getting easy not to be shocked anymore, and, and, and that's the danger. Um, I think we have to keep reminding ourselves this is much, much worse than we ever anticipated. And the danger is not getting less. It's, it's not getting better. Um, and we need to start you know, keeping records of how things used to be and, and noting the changes. Especially, you know, when there's an authoritative authoritarian move that's made that seems to defy any sense of logic or precedent without regard to consequence. Even today. Like today. And, and for the record, today um, is the, the, the day that, that... The national emergency was declared, which somehow wasn't a national emergency over the past two years, but is now. Um, and you look at the stats, and you kind of have to wonder. And, you know, he talks about terrorists that have come over the border, but just about all those that come over the northern border. But, you know, no talk of a border there. Um, I wonder what the difference is. Um, this one's really shocked me. I, uh, the level of ecological damage is, is astonishing, and it never seems to make the conversation. Um, the fact that um, southern border immigration is at a 50-year low and has been in a consistent decline for the past nine years, and we actually have negative, negative immigration um, over that border, doesn't make the conversation. So you kind of have to wonder, where is this thinking coming from? And you hear the stories about um, the wall was a meme to get candidate Trump to remember to talk about immigration, um, and that that meme, because they couldn't trust him to remember to talk about something, has morphed into this national emergency is stunning and we have to be aware of that and we have to, to make a note that this isn't how things are supposed to work and things that are a potential national emergency like it was just I guess two weeks ago that the um, NSTEC study came out did you, did you mm -hmm. know uh, there was a study that came out that was peer-reviewed um, so real science um, about we're losing um, something like two and a half percent of all insect population per year. So at that rate, within a century, 
all instincts, will, all insects will be gone. We should, you know, pretty big news because that, that's pretty much it for all of us. Um, we've got a century long fuse lit and nobody is stomping on it, trying to put that fire out before that bomb goes off. Um, and I would think at least the right wing would be on that because it's like aborting every child that might ever have been born ever throughout history. No, um, I don't want to stop using insecticide in my yard. Um, and, and the same climate change, the science is settled. That is an emergency. Nobody seems to care. I, I think there's a lot of, well, you know, I want to see them done, but I'm not changing my life for it. But no single snowflake in an avalanche holds itself responsible. That's where the danger comes from. It must have galled you then to see who, um, you know, the EPA is, is sort of manned by climate deniers and... and, and, and I, 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 he must have found all of them. I can't think of that many people with education that, uh, that have looked um, and, and still, still deny. Um, so we, were, we, were, we had an interesting election, uh, midterm election. We did. Interesting is a good word. Interesting. Um, I mean, one for the history books. People will be talking about that. What do you think about in, what happened in Georgia? Um, it's hard to say because I think some of the facts are still obscured. And uh, I hope that they will come out and be investigated very thoroughly. Um, and I say that with, with actual hope. Um, I, I, I do think that there will be some significant looks. Um, it's, it's no secret that you know, my choice wasn't elected. Um, there's a large part of me that's encouraged that she came that close. And were there not suppression, um, she may very well have won. Uh, there was um, information that came out about the uh, lieutenant governor um, race that came out. Did you see that just a couple weeks ago about um, votes mysteriously disappearing for lieutenant governor? Um, in that people often you know vote for the top of the, of the ticket and then they go down, but there were many that voted the entire ticket except for lieutenant governor, and without exception, they were all in for primarily black districts. <clears throat> so, I mean, shocking coincidence, maybe, but it is pretty shocking, and it needs to be it needs to be looked at with with sober with sober eyes. Um, the conflict of interest, it seems to be such a no brainer that that can't be allowed um, anywhere, regardless of the circumstances of the candidate. Um, there's a part of me. I, my dream is to see a voting rights amendment. And it would have to be an amendment because it would have to change the Constitution. But I'd like to see the Electoral College change so that it's proportional. So if your candidate wins 51% of the votes in Georgia, they get 51% of the electoral votes, not 100%. Um, only individuals can contribute to uh, political campaigns, not corporations. Um, a limit of, say, you know, $20,000, it can be high, I get it. But that's the whole election cycle. So, however, if, if it's all one candidate, if it's one dollar to twenty thousand candidates, that's your your choice. But a limit. Uh, we could make secure block, um, you know, blockchain or something, um, voting mechanisms. We could vote at home. We can vote on computers. We can vote on smartphones. We can vote libraries. Um, you could vote on a holiday as well. Yeah. I, I was getting. I, I'd like to see a national holiday. Um, if not, um, four hours, half day. Um, I know one company that was saying, uh, I was going to name them, I can't remember what it was, that was giving their employees um, two hours off plus their lunch, so three hours. Um, and if it took longer than that, if it took longer than three hours, <coughs> it was still fine, but you had to show your sticker. So I guess if we got there, if they ran stickers, you'd be in trouble, but uh, that's fine. But 
Um, I don't even think it has to be a day. Um, we have early voting anyway. Um, I think we can have secure. Um, if a 12 year old can hack your machine in less than an hour, it's not secure. Um, now we're led to believe that the Russians just hacked and just looked around, didn't touch anything. Okay. Um, this is not an unsolvable problem. Um, some kind of paper ballot backup would be nice, um, audit trail. But I do think a, a secure tokenized blockchain based that could be activated by smartphone or computer um, or in person. Um, automatic voter registration. Um, candidates must disclose oh, things like tax returns, etc. Um, financial information. Um, and frankly, I'd like to see candidates, um, I'm not really sure how to, how to put this tactfully, but um, anything you see on a campaign trail, you're saying it rough. In a commercial, um, in a debate, anywhere, um, and, and while in the election office, you are always under oath. You are never not under oath. Um, I think all of that would have to be an amendment because I don't think any of it is. Um, it, it, it is strictly constitutional now, so the only way to make it so would, would be an amendment. So you can have somebody saying, "Well, he was just trying to get the crowds behind him by saying that." I can say it, but you need to do that. Um, no, I, I mean people can say something and be wrong. Um, as long as not the same as lying. Um, people make mistakes. Um, so you go, oh, sorry, I was wrong. Um, yeah, but you were wrong four or five times after being corrected. At that point, there's something here. Um, or qualify it. My memory is, or I think, um, sure. Maybe we've got another couple of years to wait for um, another election, like the, the general election. Mm -hmm. No, well, a year and a half. Oh, primaries will start um, soon. But yeah. Well, the first debate's in June. Between now and and November 2020, what do you hope might happen? Blue sky. Education. Um, that's the biggest one. Um, I, 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 I'm not as in favor of impeachment as you might think. Um, I, I'd much rather see um, something change at the ballot box. But it's because somebody has, has driven a very powerful and fact-based campaign that moves people's emotions and makes them see their better selves, their higher selves and not their self-centered, afraid selves. Um, I can't think of anybody who's ever made a really solid choice out of fear. Um, our best choices come from bravery and from selflessness and from integrity. If we can see that those are desirable qualities and those are attainable qualities and those are qualities that are worth striving for and earning, then there's a lot of hope. But it also means that we can't deny things or deny our own responsibility in things. Um, that comes from everything from white privilege to climate change to um, realizing that I have to change my own choices in my own life and do away with things that make me happy and comfortable in order to make the world better for, for more. Is there anything between now and then, or just generally, that you worry you know, is, do you have fears about actually happening? Yeah, um, I'm increasingly worried about um, the media accepting a new normal and not continuing to push back. I'm in increasingly worried about the disappearance of reporting. Um, that we're talking about the news rather than exploring and reporting news. 
and um, opinion is not the same as analysis. Being able to actually dig through, sift through, look for connections um, somewhere other than you know Twitter it is critical, and to understand that complex issues aren't digestible in 140 characters or a three-minute segment before commercials. That it does take depth. Um, the idea that boarding is expensive, and we do have to pay for it, and that it does have value. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is or what that looks like, you know, public support or whatever, but um, something. Um, I'd love to see substantial debates that don't involve um, stages for talking points and stages for bumper stickers. Um, that require critical thinking. I would love to hear a candidate say, I don't know, I'm thinking about that one. That's really hard. Um, I'm gonna surround myself with really, really smart people who disagree with each other and let them arrive at a solution. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's unreasonable. And I think if, if we band it together in a bandit, and I don't mean just in America, I mean globally. Because I think our problems are global now. And when you meet people from other countries, when you travel, there's more in common than, than there's not. Um, especially since um, we globally are responsible for each other globally. Our actions in America have grave consequences around the world. And the reverse is also true. Um, looking beyond the small into the from the microcosm to the macrocosm, I guess. Um, and making decisions out of hope rather than cowardice. I think it's possible. I claim to that. And again, um, you know, with my job, my career, I think in terms of story. I think that the stories about the world will shape um, how generations approach problems. And we have a responsibility to think about what we put out. But that's only part of the battle. Um, stories sort of shapes you. Um, information arms you. Um, we need information out there. Um, we need to improve our education system. We need to improve our access to unfiltered information and better labeling for, for what we're seeing. Long answer to a short question. No, that's a yeah. very, very good answer, actually. Um, you know, it's tiring, like, being worried about all of this stuff. Like, almost every day we, we wake up and something else has happened, and um, I guess the the shock is wearing off a little bit, but it still um, chips away at your psyche. Is there anything you can think of that that, that people could use like to help them, like a coping mechanism? Yeah, community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the signs I saw the airport march, um, most of them were political. Um, I mentioned the motherfucker one. But my favorite one, even above that one, was one that someone was just said, see y'all at the next one, um, which was funny. But there was an assumption of hope too. There was an assumption that we're a movement, we're together, we're a community, and we're gonna keep sticking together over time. Um, I think people have found communities and are bonding with them more. Um, and I, I use the word community carefully because I don't think it means the same thing as tribalism. We're not just gathering with, with, with our own inside our safe castle walls. Um, they're synonymous words that almost mean the opposite, if that makes sense at all. Um, community's big and looks beyond. Um, tribal is small and, and, and wrapped up in a shell. I think people are finding genuine community now. And I think that's where we'll endure. And I think that's where hope comes from. 
But let's go back to, I've got just a couple more questions to ask you. Which, sure. when you, because you said that you didn't really have any expectations when you went to the Women's March. Was there anything then, when you, looking back, thinking about it, that actually surprised you? Definitely process. Um, the other thing was how um, thoroughly people had prepared. And honestly, it reminded me of two things. Um, I was on a train, part of a train one time, and it was the same week that the um, SEC kickoff game and Dragon Con were in Atlanta. And I was on a train, and like a third of the people were dressed like me, just in regular clothes, and a third were in their Dragon Con costumes, which were amazing. And the other half were in like football jerseys with their faces painted. Um, there was that sort of enthusiasm and community and a longing to belong somewhere. And I was a little bit surprised to recognize that same urge to find people who are like me, um, my place to fit, my place to belong in a world that's, that's troubling and scary, at the Women's March. Um, I found it oddly comforting. Um, we do have this urge to find people who are like us, a place where we belong. I mean, one of the things that makes Harry Potter work so well is it's about this, this orphan who finds this place where he fits and where people recognize that he's special. And we all have that wish. And I think people were finding that at the Women's March. And I think it's endured. Did you feel emotional at all? Oh, yeah. You? Yeah. Were there, were there specific moments that you just like, that hit you? Uh, I think getting out of the rain onto the MARTA platform and, and hearing the music and the singing and seeing the size of that crowd. And then thinking, oh my gosh, this train is coming from Decatur. And then he's like, um, it's going to be crowded by the time it gets here. And it was. But it was amazing. It was great. Um, it, it, it was wonderful. Um, it was hard not to be moved by that. And then um, getting down to this sea of humanity. One of the, one of the, one of the pictures I took was um, and when you, you get down to the dome and turn left and start coming back towards the city, there's this big bridge. And I took a picture of the crowd ahead of me, the sea of humanity as far as the eye could see. And then behind me, going back down to where the speeches were, and it's, it's the same. It's, yeah, I'd never seen a crowd like that before. Um, most people haven't seen a crowd like that before. Um, it, was astonishing, and I, you know, I've, I've been to sold-out games before as sports sports events, but I've never seen that type of crowd before. That's why I think the numbers are are, are, are so underreported. Um, even the police were saying, you know, um, I saw people entering from well outside the perimeter. That sea of humanity was was astonishing. It was. Unity. It was diversity, um, and it was genuine. That's the kind of thing you can't fake. Um, if people say that they were paid protesters, it's really hard to hire about tens of thousands of extras for anything. Um, you know, show me one paycheck. Show me a show me a receipt. Show me anything. Um, because authenticity has a feel, and it's universal. You can always, always tell it, even, even created authenticity. Um, there's a bar in Decatur that um, is new, but when it opened, it already looked old and had a, an old feel. And despite the fact that it was essentially a set, it had a, a feeling of authenticity. I think because of the care and the craftsmanship that people put into to crafting a specific experience they wanted to offer. Um, it wasn't, you know, shopping mall cookie cutter. It was new, but it was real. Authenticity has a feel, and that was that was everywhere. And it's very moving. It's very powerful. It's you know, shattering in a way. It's, it's difficult to process in the moment because all you can think of is hooray and yay and I'm here and you're here and isn't this great. 
the processing comes later, if at all. Um, you know, something was born then. Um, but when something is born, and you use that metaphor, it's like being born, literally and figuratively. The baby doesn't know what, what just happened or what it's about. Um, that understanding becomes that understanding comes years later, if at all. And for most of us, never. Um, all we can do is experience it and ride with it and see where it grows out of it. So I, I get from what you're saying that you feel like the, the, the march is a successful start to something. Can you talk about, like, like since the march, how, how the march legacy has kind of like shown itself? Well, time will tell. Um, I think um, the last election to turn out the energy um, was a pretty good sign. Um, I think the next election, already the, the enthusiasm that's there. Um, I think um, you're seeing, I mentioned neighborhood church. Um, it was reborn around that time. The old church had been worshiping about eight people, now it's 150 something. Um, I think a large part of that was the community that was born at that march. That there's little pockets of activism and community and, and sharing. Um, one thing I'd love to do, I'd love to research, is, is how giving has changed. Um, I don't have any numbers about that. But I'd love to know. And I don't mean just political campaign giving, but charitable giving. Um, I've seen a lot of um, those signs in neighborhoods about whatever the language, I'm glad you're my neighbor, or in this house we believe, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I saw them planted, and most of the ones I saw are still there. Um, I'm seeing more added, more than old ones taken away. I think there is, is an urge to be better, to be defined not by fear. Um, I think the jokes are good, and I'm not being sarcastic, but um, the memes that come on, um, there's a strength in humor. What you can laugh at can't destroy you. Um, seeing that humor um, is really powerful. Like there was one where it was a video clip of, of a guy um, literally saying in the same sentences that Mexicans are rapists and drug dealers. And then they cut and then it, you can see the time code, it's like less than a minute later. He's saying, and they're all here to take our jobs. And the caption at the bottom was, tell me, sir, just what is it you do for a living? Um, because it points out the absurdity, really in, in all sides of the argument. Um, when you can laugh at something, Laughter creates bond. Um, when you can laugh at yourself, you can grow. When you can laugh with other people, you can grow. When you can laugh with the community, you can at least say, we're together in this. Um, so I'm gonna stand by the jokes. Um, I think it's a golden age for the um, late night TV hosts. Um, I mean, Saturday Night Live is, is relevant again for the first time in decades. Um, I ache for Jon Stewart, but um, Stephen Colbert, all of them are really doing an amazing job. Um, the constant remind that this is absurd, this is not right, this is not democracy, this is not what we fought for, this is not what we made terrible mistakes for, this is not what we've overcome our own shortcomings for. This is not right. We can do better. We are better. Let's do better. I have one last question. Take your time. Um, if it's a simple one, we'll make two. The, um, if somebody, if there's a young person who's thinking about going to a march, what would your piece of advice be to them? Absolutely go. Um, even go if you disagree, um, just to see the activism and the energy. Um, and I have not taken that advice. I have not gone to a MAGA rally or anything like that. Um, but there's a, a way you can tell. If anybody is afraid, 
you're in the wrong place. Um, go to where you feel welcomed, where people will accept you, and where people will protect you, and where people will stand up for you. And if you see, and it's not just you, if you see any, a place where anybody can't say that, you're in the wrong place. That's a really great way to finish up. Uh, my very last question is, is there, is there anything I haven't asked you that you feel like you, you want to express? Nothing I can think of. Um, sorry, I've been kind of just flowing with it, I haven't really... Mm. Um, I'm glad you didn't ask me to quote the signs, because I really can't remember them. Um, it's too long since, since the, the more I think yeah. people remember them. I just remember that so many of them were so clever and so well done and so artistically done. And I remember singing with people, you know, singing creates a bond. Um, I remember chanting, but the music more than anything. You know, that we shall overcome and stuff like that. Amazing Grace, stuff like that. And, and hearing those that swell over um, was astonishing. Well, I'm really grateful that you came and did a, an interview with this. Likewise. It's a great addition to our collection. Great. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.